Good morning, Little Masters, and welcome back to today's Tolkien Times. I'm the Man of the West, also from the Prancing Pony Podcast. Let's get week 39 of today's Tolkien Times underway with Mailbag Monday. Now, before we get into today's question, I want to follow up on a question from three weeks ago about what Feanor might have thought about the race of men had he encountered them. Now, thanks to Baragon for sending me a really deep cut on this one. Baragon pointed me to a piece called Sikente Feanor, found in Parma el Delamaran number 15. Now, it was actually written in the predecessor language to Quenya, and quite likely as early as 1917. Now, Tolkien didn't provide a translation, but Christopher Gilson, the chief editor of Parma el Delamaran and one of the foremost linguistic experts on Tolkien's works, provided the following as the most likely literal translation. Men are not beings good by nature, but rather they are to all deeds evil inclined. Now said Feanor the wise, in other manner than was said before by those from whom this birth was known. Less than good, I said, are the hearts of these men, and although their having escaped the long search may be good, they can be smelled out by Melkor, whom they are bound to or have looked for. There on the throne of hate, they blessed the great evil. We know literally nothing about when this was supposed to have been spoken by Feanor, though we can kind of guess from some context. Baragon suggests that perhaps this version of the tale had a Feanor who lived longer into the wars of Beleriand and was commenting on reports from Finrod about the Edine. Whatever the case, it seems that even non-canonical Feanor in pre quenya language had nothing good to say about men. Now, on to today's question. Sam writes in with a really interesting one. Do we know what the official areas of influence that the five Istari covered? I know the blues went east. Radagast seems to cover birds and beasts. Gandalf seems to do everyday common people. Saruman doesn't seem to get any area. Maybe he was supposed to cover the kings and lords. All right. Any excuse to go to the chapter on the Astari and Unfinished Tales is a good one, so thank you, Sam. The short answer, though, to your question is this. The evidence suggests there were actually no specific areas of influence for each of the five named Istari. In fact, let's get started by taking a look at the Istari chapter. Now, one thing to keep in mind, all of this came from a 1954 essay that Christopher Tolkien used to create this detailed account. Now, in it, we first read, and I'll be skipping some bits in order to stay focused on the question. They came from over the sea out of the uttermost west. Emissaries they were from the lords of the west, the Valar who still took counsel for the governance of Middle-earth. And when the shadow of Sauron began first to stir again, took this means of resisting him. And this the Valar did, desiring to amend the errors of old, especially that they had attempted to guard and seclude the Eldar by their own might and glory fully revealed. Whereas now their emissaries were forbidden to reveal themselves in forms of majesty, or to seek to rule the wills of men or elves by open display of power but coming in shapes weak and humble, were bidden to advise and persuade men and elves to good, and to seek to unite in love and understanding all those whom Sauron, should he come again, would endeavor to dominate and corrupt. Now this fits with letter number 156, where Tolkien describes the wizards as emissaries from the true West, and so immediately from God, sent precisely to strengthen the resistance of the good when the Valar become aware that the shadow of Sauron is taking shape again. Then again, in letter number 211, where he adds that the Istari, or wizards, were emissaries of the Valar and of their kind. Now, letter 144 also confirms this, but interestingly, adds a bit about their job. They were thought to be emissaries, in the terms of this tale, from the far west beyond the sea, and their proper function, maintained by Gandalf and perverted by Saruman, was to encourage and bring out the native powers of the enemies of Sauron. And then we read this interesting tidbit. Of this order, the number is unknown, but of those that came to the north of Middle-earth, where there was most hope, because of the remnant of the Dunedain and of the Eldar that abode there, the chiefs were five. Okay, so what do we know from all this? Well, first, that there were apparently many wizards, and that the ones in the part of Middle-earth that we're dealing with in the stories of the Legendarium are themselves led by five chief wizards. Now, also, from the first passage in Tolkien's letters, they all have the same job description. Advise and persuade the children of Iluvatar to good, and then work to unite them in opposition to Sauron. That's their jobs. 
Now, while we get physical descriptions of each of them, we are never told of any significance to the color of their clothing. Saruman is said to be of noble mien, that means look or manner, and bearing, with raven hair and a fair voice, and he was clad in white. Great skill he had in works of hand and was regarded as the head of the order. He's really the one that we get the most on because we get very limited descriptions of the others, two clad in sea blue and one in earth and brown, before we get to Gandalf, one who seemed the least, less tall than the others, and in looks more aged, gray-haired and gray-clad, and leaning on a staff. But here's the thing. Though they all had the same job, it is fair to say they had different affinities, different skill sets. Saruman was known as Kurunir, the man of craft, which certainly fits with what we know of him from the primary works. Radagast, it is said, became enamored of the many beasts and birds that dwelt in Middle-earth and forsook elves and men and spent his days among the wild creatures. Thus he got his name, which is in the tongue of Numenor of old, and signifies, it is said, tender of beasts. But both he and Saruman fell. Now, Radagast, precisely because he became enamored of the beasts and birds, and Saruman, we're told, fell because he became proud and impatient and enamored of power and was later ensnared by Sauron. Now, as for the Blue Wizards, we'll go back to letter 211 where Tolkien explains, I really don't know anything clearly about the other two since they do not concern the history of the Northwest. I think they went as emissaries to distant regions, east and south, far out of Numenorean range, missionaries to enemy-occupied lands, as it were. What success they had, I do not know, but I fear that they failed as Saruman did, though doubtless in different ways. And I suspect they were founders or beginners of secret cults and magic traditions that outlasted the fall of Sauron. So, while Radagast and Saruman and apparently the two blues failed, Tolkien did later revisit the idea of the Blue Wizards in Last Writings, found in the Peoples of Middle-earth, where he wrote, Their task was to circumvent Sauron, to bring help to the few tribes of men that had rebelled from Melkor worship, to stir up rebellion, and after his first fall, to search out his hiding, in which they failed, and to cause dissension and disarray among the Dark East. They must have had very great influence on the history of the Second Age and Third Age in weakening and disarraying the forces of the East, who would both in the Second Age and Third Age otherwise have outnumbered the West. Now, in this version, they actually got sent to Middle-earth around the same time as Glorfindel in the Second Age, Second Age 1600, when Sauron forged the One Ring and built Barad-dûr. When I say they, I mean just the Blues. Now, they had different names then, too. Morinechtar, Darkness Slayer and Romestamo, East Helper. But this version likely dates from 1973, the last year of Tolkien's life, and was never developed in any further way. But here's the thing. From all of these sources, the letters, Tolkien's last writings, the essay on the Astari, and more, there's nothing at all about any of the wizards having separate areas of responsibility or individual job descriptions. Sorry about that, Sam. Well, folks, that wraps it up for Mailbag Monday. If you have a question you'd like me to answer, please email it to barnum at theprancingponypodcast.com. Let them know it's for today's Tolkien Times, and I'll get to it as soon as possible, with priority going to supporters of the show on Patreon. Now, if you'd like to help me keep making this show better every season, please visit patreon.com slash Tolkien Times to find out how you can join the TTT Content Council, get a bonus episode every week, and more. Join me again tomorrow on today's Tolkien Times for Tolkien Tuesday as we learn more about the professor himself. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Follow or subscribe in your podcast apps and follow at Tolkien Times on social media. And finally, as Faramir says, go with the goodwill of all good men. <laughs>